Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Aaron Adelheit, author of The Heartbreak, The Case for a 24-6 Lifestyle. He is the Chief Strategy Officer of Flow Technologies. Since selling his company, The American Home, in 2015, Aaron founded Mindset Capital, a private investment firm. He's been featured in the Wall Street Journal, CNBC, CNBC, Bloomberg, and the New York Times, and has given lectures on entrepreneurship and investments all over the United States, Canada, and South Africa. Aaron serves on the board of the Moisha House Foundation and is a partner of Social Venture Partners in Santa Barbara, working on homelessness. And he is an advocate of the 24-6 lifestyle. Aaron Adelheit, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you so much for having me. Aaron, uh, take us kind of back to your upbringing. You grew up in a, a pretty typical, uh, let's maybe secular, not religious Jewish home. Yes, that's right. I, we, it's called the kind of uh, reform uh, Jewish, uh, you know, kind of light on religion and uh, spirituality. I got a bar mitzvah. I would celebrate uh you know, the Jewish New Year and Passover and things like that, but uh, and light Friday night candles. But beyond that, not much more. Okay. Now, was that under the influence of mom and dad or your grandparents? Yeah. Uh, mom and dad. Okay. And uh, your grandparents, where did they come from? We all, my, my family came from Galicia and from Hungary. Uh, we, we all come from somewhere. Uh, yeah, so well, some of my grandparents came from... Uh, Poland and Hungary. Uh, other grandparents actually came uh, from um, uh, the Netherlands, actually. Okay. Uh, you know, as a sidebar, it's really quite interesting. Here's two Jewish guys having a conversation. And uh, there are many uh, Christians in the world that look at us and say, wow, you, you know, you guys have this incredible tradition, this incredible long biblical history, and yet um, maybe you went to shul, maybe you didn't go to shul. I, I was raised conservadox because when I was uh, a boy, uh, Reformed Judaism didn't have bar mitzvahs. That was something that came in your generation, uh, which was the one right after mine. Uh, so I, I went to conservative shul with my grandparents, and spent all every weekend with them under that influence, and then went on uh, with those studies. Uh, but uh, the idea of being Jewish and uh, God's chosen people, uh, if you take a look at our 5,000 year history, it's almost 6,000 year history, you're almost inclined to say, couldn't you choose somebody else for a change? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, That's one of my favorite jokes from Tevia, but, uh, of course. but you know, I actually, my own personal belief and um, is that uh, Judaism is much more of that it's something that you have to choose. Uh, so it's, it, 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 yes, I think that it's you choosing God. It's not necessarily that, you, that God has chosen you, but that's, again, just my own personal well, no, belief. That's, I, I think that's a, absolutely a universal truth is that we, we actually see that um, within even within Genesis, we see that God walked with Adam, but Enoch walked with God and Noah walked with God. They had to make the choice. Adam didn't make that choice. God w walked with him, but, but Adam didn't walk with God. Uh, Enoch made the choice, and all of us have to make that choice as whether or not we're going to travel and choose. Uh, that, that's as strong a Jewish uh, ethic and principle as it is a uh, uh, Christianity or other faith systems. Um, each one of us has to come to a, a decision time and you know part of your background um, led you to a decision time not necessarily from a religious perspective but you kind of came up into a need for what you call a hard break, uh, the title of the book, a hard break. Not a soft break, but a hard break. What led up to that in your backstory? I'm, I'm sorry, I lost you for just one second. Can you, can you please repeat your sure, question? Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, as we take a look at your story, you came upon yeah. a time where you came to the realization 
that you needed a hard break and you had gone yeah. through a period of some challenges that led you to this need. Uh, kind of set that up for us to see what, yeah. what, what happened, how you got there, and what does it mean uh, to, how do you define a hard break? Yeah, so what I, I did is, um, I, I, what you should know about me is that I'm a workaholic. And I'm driven in ways that I'm not sure that I understand. And so I would work all the time, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, nonstop. And I hit a point in my life after experiencing success at uh, quite a young age, and I discuss this in my book, um, where all of a sudden I hit some adversity. Uh, my personal life was suffering. I didn't have much of a spiritual life. And I um, then hit a wall uh, in business. And my business results uh, started suffering. And uh, my first inclination was, well, to get ahead, I need to work harder. I need to put in more effort. I need to double down. And that didn't work. And I, I uh, suddenly had to confront myself that my, the way I was living my life was not working in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and so it was really out of desperation that I, I came and I said, and it was kind of falling back on my Jewish tradition of, well, maybe I should take a, a break. And so um, how much of a workaholic I am is that I said to myself, well, maybe what I can do is turn off my phone on Friday night right before I go to bed, and I'll try to make it till noon the next day. And it felt like some gargantuan task in my life to go ahead and, and actually do that. Um, and, and of course, it's silly, uh, you know, if you think about it, because it's really only four or five hours. Um, and uh, I, I then was able to do that. And after a couple of weeks thought, well, maybe I can stretch it to 2 or 3 p.m. And then eventually, after a couple of months, I said, I, I can do a whole day. And what happened is, is it completely transformed my life, not only personally, but professionally. Um, and I've been doing it now for 12 or 13 years. And what I found is, is that when the financial crisis hit in 2008 or 2009, that my Sabbath practice not only helped me weather the storm, but actually helped me um, think creatively, and I started a business of buying foreclosed homes, fixing them up and renting them out. And I was able to, because I think of my Sabbath practice and having a complete day off, build that company to 2,500 single family rental homes. And three years ago, we sold the company to a publicly traded real estate investment trust. And it was only after that sale, when I witnessed all the people that I worked with all of my employees, uh, from investment bankers to secretaries, my own self, other other people that I owe people that there's a way to do things that are, that is different, and so that's why I wrote this book because it enabled my success. It enables me to sustain on a much longer basis. It's transformed my life. Um, and, and that's really why I'm here. So in this process, you're a workaholic. You're married at the time? I, I, I'm sorry, you broke up just one more time. Can, can you ask that again? Yes. Uh, you were married at the time of your workaholism? No. At, at that time, I was, uh, I was not... Uh, I was not a, um, I was, I was single. And this is why I really, I men mentioned in the book that, um, so I was single when I did it. And I'm so glad that it, when it happened, it happened because I met my wife only because I started exploring my own faith and my own tradition. Uh, I met her actually at a Jewish learning conference. Um, you know, and so, uh, 
you know, now I have three kids. I have a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a nine-month-old. Uh, I have multiple businesses. I just wrote a book. Uh, my life is very full. I feel very lucky. And now it's even more important uh, for my family life um, because during the week, I don't get to spend much time with my kids. They're very young, so they, you know, you know, when they wake up early in the morning and before they go to bed, you know, before 8 p.m., I don't get much time. And even when I do, my phone, I have emails and texts and phone calls. And I've even noticed that when I'm on the floor with uh, playing with my daughter, my four year old daughter, I'll go to turn on some music on my phone or I'll go to take a picture and I'm playing with her because she's doing something cute. And then all of a sudden I'll notice, oh, I have an email or oh, someone texted me, and I'll go to check that, and she'll immediately, even if it's four or five seconds, will say, Papa, will you play with me? My first reaction is, well, I am playing with you. you know, I'm right here, and, uh, but she's, she's right. She does not have my full attention, and she knows it. On the Sabbath, my phone is off, and she has my full attention. So, uh, I've been blessed. I I feel lucky that I found that that I experienced the adversity, and I think a lot of people who've come to faith uh, experience adversity in their life. And I didn't even mention my health. That I had to have surgery during this time. Again, I mentioned in my in my book 12, 13 years ago. I feel really lucky that I was challenged and I faced this adversity, found my faith, and it enabled me to transform my life so then then I can be a better father, not only be successful in business, but be a better father, a better husband. Um, anyway, so that's... So from an accountability standpoint, does your wife keep you? Is this something that you found that now that you've been doing it for a while has become inherent to uh, your character and to who you are and or or do you yes yeah, no i think look i i admit i'm a workaholic i'm addicted to my phone this is both the best and the worst thing that has ever happened to me okay and i still deal with it i have wrote this book because i'm still dealing with it um you know my wife has taken my phone from me and thrown it in the bushes okay this is something that i uh, and still de dealing with. Now, I've now taken the Sabbath practice and recognizing that the power that the phone has um, and how it's really engineered to kind of hack our brains, you know, to give us what our brains want. So before I now leave it in the kitchen, I don't bring it into the bedroom. I now, when we're eating a meal, it's away. It's not on the table. Um, you know, and, and taking those kind of steps, but I'm still on my journey. I still struggle with it. Um, I'm getting better at it, but you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm still on my journey. The Sabbath for me is just the beginning, the opening salvo, I believe, in becoming a better person. Well, Aaron, you, you said writing the book was a three-year process this was something that you kind of had to work through. Uh, it was always at the forefront of your mind. Uh, the, yeah, but the, 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 the three years, why it took so long is I wanted to make the business case for the Sabbath. Because, you know, even if you tell your listeners and your watchers and the people that follow you, hey, you should take a hard break, you should take a Sabbath, their first reaction, or their therapist, or their husband, their wife, parents, their friends, and they came and, and you came to a person who was working hard and trying to succeed and said, you need to take a Sabbath. It'll be good for you. Their first reaction, I know because this was me, would, you don't know what modern work is like. You don't know what my life is like. I can't do this. I have to provide for my family. I have to respond to these texts. I, you don't understand. And so my the, the reason I wrote the book is I wanted to say, well, actually, yes, I do understand. And not only am I going to tell my story, but I'm going to share the stories of other people across faiths, across industries, who work just as hard as you, 
and are succeeding because of the Sabbath. And I wanted to share with you research from Stanford, Harvard, the Centers for Disease Control, of decades of research that are showing that working all the time is not only hazardous to your health, hazardous to your mental health, but really bad for business. So I wanted to make the case, and, and that's why there's 200 footnotes in the book, because every time I make an assertion, I want it to be backed up by fact. And so that's what took me, that's what took me the time. And you actually break the book down that way. In part one, the 24-7 Life shares research and case studies, studies that show how detrimental overwork is to productivity, safety, and health. And you cited examples of the uh, Challenger, of the... Uh, the Space the, Shuttle, the, Challenger, the yes. The Space Shuttle. Uh, you alluded to... Uh, well, to the Space Shuttle Challenger, what, what I was trying to highlight there is... What do you get when you work all the time? Well, it turns out that once you work past 55 hours, you're really getting kind of garbage or you're getting very, very low quality time. And the longer you sustain that, um, the less quality of your work. And so what does it mean to have less quality? What well, means that you're more likely to have mistakes? You're more likely to be injured. You're more likely to get sick. And so the Space Shuttle Challenger, and specific that example was, they found out that one of the, the basically the principal cause of the Space Shuttle Challenger explosion and tragedy was because the decision makers who basically decided to go forward with the Space Shuttle launch had been working nonstop for weeks and months on end. And when it came time to make a critical decision, they were exhausted and they made the wrong one. And, and that's just one anecdote, but it's backed up by lots of, uh, of research. And, and that is more and more of our lives is about problem solving. More and more of our jobs is about being creative, problem solving, um, and really trying to process information as opposed to just consume more information. And so when you work more and more and your brain gets exhausted, um, you're actually going to fail at what you need to succeed. The workaholic lifestyle, that Eastern European hard work ethic that we were raised with, that uh, uh, do something good, make something good out of your life. Uh, we have that e example of uh, Maybe you heard about the struggles. I know uh, the shtetl where my grandparents came from. I've been to the city. I've been to the place. I know where my father came from. I know where my family died at Babiar. I know where my, my cousin was at Ravensbrook. I've been to the various camps where my family was. I know the struggles that, that they had been through with the loss of life. Uh, the persecution and the message why my name is Walker it's because Vovovich was not going to be a name that my father's family which was Croatian through Hungary was going to carry into the new world and so <laughs> you know my grand my grandfather said give me five five choices one two three four five are the most American names uh, that are available uh, Johnson Jones uh, Walker well, Walker, that's a good one. Uh, we'll take Walker. Uh, this was the whole transaction. Uh, yeah. That's how it went from Vovovich to Walker. Uh, <clears throat> so we, we were given this ethic, this, this work ethic, uh, be a mensch, uh, be a good person, uh, be a philanthropist, uh, make something of yourself. If you're not going to be a doctor, then a lawyer. Uh, if you're not a lawyer, then investments. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's it. Wall Street, the investment world, um, uh, you know, something to do with making money. Uh, and in order to do that, you have to be faster, smarter, better, and work harder than the next guy because he's after the same dollar you are. And that's, that's the part that is the mistake right there is it's about working smarter, not necessarily harder is is and and this is what all of the research shows um and one of the surprising aspects is and i devote part of my book 
is how sports is actually showing us the way. And so there's been a revolution in sports around the use of data and understanding and really uh, you, um, using that in, in a way to build teams to win and to maximize your players. And so it used to be, for example, in baseball, I don't know if you're a baseball fan, but in baseball, it used to be pitchers would pitch nine innings all the time. And you people would look, is the pitcher having a complete game, which is you'd pitch nine innings. Now, you rarely, if ever, do that because once they found, once you go over 100 pitch pitches in a game, the arm gets tired, you don't perform as well, and you kind of fall off. And so, in fact, when the Cubs won the World Series, they almost lost the World Series because their specialty p- pitcher, who maybe pitches 20 or 30 pitches in a game, their relief pitcher was tired because he had gone in for three games in a row, which is if you had gone 20 or 30 years ago, people would look at you like you were crazy. Right. Um, and, and so that's just like one example is that it's, it's, it's about working smarter. And what I love about what the research is showing is the research is tying into something that we know from thousands of years of truth, which is that the Sabbath is good for you and that God provided it for us. And it's how ridiculous is it that God needs a break, but we don't. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, kind of an arrogant but kind of a just completely misguided view that somehow we need to keep going and somehow we can sustain this um uh but but god cannot and and that's why i wanted to marry the latest in research with this beautiful you know judeo-christian tradition of thousands of years old to say this it's it's more important now than it's ever been I, I agree with you. I've worked a 24-6 lifestyle for many, many years. And I can tell you that uh, I'm, I, God redeems my time. Uh, I have two books on the market. I do three hours of live TV, five days a week. I teach four, uh, three nights and one day a week of uh, an advanced um, master's and, and doctoral level uh, coursework that... Uh, and I always have plenty of time uh, for many, many things, play tennis and stay very active. So uh, I completely agree with the 24-6 lifestyle and I make 24-6 commitments. I don't make 24-7 commitments. We're talking with Aaron Edelheit, uh, author of The Hard Break, The Case for a 24-6 Lifestyle. When we come back from break, we're gonna talk about the stunning surprises of how many successful businesses operate on a 24-6 work week. You know some of the names, Chick-fil-A, Hobby Lobby, and a couple of others, but the research says that they have not sacrificed even a nickel for having a 24-6 lifestyle flying in the face of every corporate management book that's out there when stores begin to open on Sundays. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back with Aaron Eidelheit, author of The Hard Break, The Case for the 24-6 Lifestyle. Back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Ignatica Nation and host of the daily TV program Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the Books and Media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order 
and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live four hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices in who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Aaron Edelheit, author of The Heartbreak, The Case for a 24-6 Lifestyle. Aaron, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Before we went to break, I mentioned that you were surprised at, uh, <clears throat> or, or wanted to ask you, were you surprised at how many successful businesses operate on this 24-6 work week? And the examples I gave were Chick Fil A and Hobby Lobby. Um, yeah, I was, I was, um, I wasn't surprised that there were other people that operate on the Sabbath. I was more surprised at the level of success they have. Mm -hmm. So Chick Fil A, I think, is kind of like the the pinnacle, the the best example of how powerful the Sabbath can be. So let me explain. The average Chick-fil-A does four times the revenue of the average KFC, even though KFC is open every day. Like, that's remarkable. That Chick-fil-A actually grosses more per store than any other fast food chain, and it's not even close. 
they did nine billion dollars in sales last year in two or three years they're going to be the number three fast food chain in the country and sometime in the future if they continue their growth trajectory they will be the number one fast food chain in the united states and they are closed every sunday it's remarkable and when i dove in and i talked to executives at chick-fil-a and i really dove into the numbers it turns out that at the foundation of all that success is the sabbath and i think that for them it's something of what i call a keystone habit and so what is that it actually is a phrase that comes from a wonderful book called the power of habit um and a keystone habit is the type of a habit that transforms everything else. Um, and that's what I think the Sabbath is. And so for Chick-fil-A, it started with, hey, we want to care for our employees and for them to have time for their spiritual life and their family life. So we're going to keep the Sabbath, even when everybody else is going to leave it. And then after a while, they said, OK, well, we care for our, you know, our employees and we, we care for them. Who are our, our, our employees? Turns out that most of their employees are seasonal workers, you know, people that come in or go into school. Um, and so they said, well, how else can we benefit them? So they started offering them scholarships. Chick-fil-A has millions, millions of dollars of scholarships over the years to their employees. And then they said, well, okay, well, we care, uh, we care about our employees, but you know, are we caring about our customers? And so they said, well, what are we feeding them? And they said, well, actually, maybe we should take the antibiotics out of the chickens. So the only fast food chain that has taken the antibiotics out of their chickens. And then they've even transformed that into caring for the actual chickens. And so in a couple of years, all of their chickens will be cage free. And I think this all stems from the fact, and this is the power of the Sabbath, really, of when you're not working all the time, you start asking yourself bigger questions and it starts leading to kind of a greater truth. Um, and, and so how does that translate into the business world? Well, people know when they come into a Chick-fil-A, Man, every time you buy, drive by a Chick-fil-A, it's closed on Sunday. You're like, oh, I wish that was open. And not only that, you think, wow, if they're willing to be closed on Sunday and they're that strict, I bet they're pretty strict about the cleanliness of their restaurants. And they are. And their bathrooms are very clean. And I bet they're pretty strict on customer service. And they're the number one ranked for customer service. But that also comes from the fact that they care for their employees. Their employees feel cared for, they care for the customers. And it all translates down to the bottom line into being, uh, building a culture that is based on the Sabbath that is really hard to duplicate. It's really, really hard because it's one of culture. Being intentional about every aspect of business has been the secret to success for more than one enterprise and having a clear set of of programs training uh, advancement expectations performance reviews accountability high moral standard uh, have all been the cornerstone of some of the most successful organizations that have ever existed <clears throat> but the idea of introducing the sabbath into it uh, is something that is unique to several companies, uh, Hobby Lobby being one of them, uh, Chick-fil-A being another. Uh, were you able to find others that were? Oh, embracing? yeah, for sure. I mean, this is the thing is I was really surprised across uh, industries. Um, so uh, another uh, very prominent businessman, uh, venture capitalist, actually, a guy named Brad Felt, um, who is one of the most successful uh, venture capitalists around, uh, he takes a digital Sabbath. So for him, um, he has uh, openly struggled with depression and mental health issues. And this is actually um, 
a re- unfortunately relatively common thing for people that are starting businesses, entrepreneurs, and one of the hidden secrets of Silicon Valley is there's this culture of burnout, of uh, mental health issues and depression. And so it has helped Brad transform his life. He has not only gone from taking this digital Sabbath, but he has extended it. And now he takes one week off a quarter um, in addition to the Sabbath. And he said he's doing the best work he's ever done. And, and there are other CEOs who have learned um, the CEO of 1-800-GOT-JUNK, uh, again, hit a struggling point in his business. His marriage fell apart, and he realized he needed to do something different. And he started observing a Sabbath. And then it was so successful, he actually created what he called a think day, where he doesn't work traditionally, but he actually tries to just think and process information as opposed to just doing a bunch of things. Um, And that's a common thing that I found when you're finding people that are observing, that start observing and taking the Sabbath on as they say, this is amazing. This is really helpful. How else can I integrate this into my life? Uh, And that is, um, I talk a lot about vacations. You know, Americans have gave up last year something like 700 million paid vacation days. And even when they're on vacation, you hear about things like workations, and they're answering emails and doing work while they're on vacation. And you're starting to see some enlightened CEOs who are saying, no, this is actually not good for business. It's not only not good for my employees, but it's not good for business. And so there was one CEO I profile in the book who has started paying his employees to disconnect on vacation. And he calls it paid, paid vacation. Um, There is a lawyer that I profile in my book um, who was a workaholic just like me, uh, who eventually transitioned to an Orthodox Jewish lifestyle. He was a very senior partner of a mergers and acquisitions law firm. And I can tell you most mergers and acquisitions happen on the weekends. He has had a tremendously successful career and also a very uh, uh, enriching personal life despite having to deal with a daughter who had uh, severe health issues and unfortunately is no longer uh, Mm. here. So I profile, even goes to Boston Consulting Group. This is my favorite story uh, from the book. So consulting is uh, notoriously a brutal uh, work schedule. You're working all the time. You're traveling all the time. Boston Consulting Group was dealing with high turnover and low engagement. People would come into Boston and, and work really hard and use it as a stepping stone to go elsewhere. The partners were like, we don't know what to do. A Harvard professor comes in and says, hey, I want to I try an experiment. I want to try an experiment with giving people some time off and see how they perform. And then the partners are like, okay, we're, we're open for a small experiment. Go find a team within Boston. And Boston Consulting Group is a huge company. Um, go find a team and, and, and let us know how it goes. So she goes in. Now imagine that this is insane. If you were to go back 30 years ago, what I'm describing to you, we, they would literally think, of, especially 50 or 70 years ago, they would think we were insane. They go in, they try to find, and she can't find anyone. No one is willing to be told that they don't want to, to be given time off. Why? Because they're afraid it's going to hurt their career. They're not going to be able to service their clients. They're like, no way am I going to do this. It used to be that bankers' hours were the rich, that you work from nine to three and they're out in the golf course, and we've changed. We're now working in status and being busy. You're now viewed as some, you know, as some upper echelon, and we compete on these extreme schedules. It's, 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 it's like mass is insanity. Um, but that's another point. So anyway, so eventually the partners have to intervene find one team. They say, it's not going to hurt your career. Uh, we're going to make sure that you're protected. 
And so finally, this small team of consultants agrees, we're going to do it. So what happens? So they institute for one day, you got to take time off. A one day a week. And they're like, okay. After a couple of weeks, they're like, oh my, my God, this is amazing. I'm having fresh ideas. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm feeling refreshed. And then they started asking themselves, hey, wait a minute, why are we having three hour meetings? Can't we just accomplish this in 30 minutes? And then other people would find that I need to back this person up on their day off. Oh, this is why this person is always asking me for this. I now understand their job better. So they started finding teams working better together. They were getting great feedback from their client and customer base. People in the same office started seeing and hearing from these employees who um, had their day off and they started saying, hey, how can I get my day off? The partners, realizing they were on to something, decided to roll something out. And in classic consultant speak, they rolled out something called predictable time off. Do you know what I call it? I call it the Sabbath. Yes. It's been around for thousands of years. And now their engagement is soaring. The people in their company now see Boston Consulting Group as a long-term career path. And they're uh, ranked the number three best company to work for. So they were able to recruit the best talent. And this is them basically recreating something that has existed for thousands of years. You know, it's interesting that the wording in the Hebrew text says to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. There's two very distinct aspects. One is the honoring of it, and the other one is keeping it holy, meaning not to be profaned. And so uh, what much of our audience does, is not familiar with is the tradition of uh, what begins uh, the biblical Sabbath, which would be uh, at the time the sun sets, and uh, depending on which rabbi you follow, either two or three stars are seen uh, in the sky would be the beginning of it. Uh, there is a prohibition against lighting a fire, starting an engine. Uh, when we're in Israel, which I take 10 days of every year and spend it in Israel <clears throat> and have for the last 16 years, uh, I take 48 or 50 of my closest friends with me every year. Uh, but uh, the, even the elevators are pre-programmed to stop at every floor. Uh, they are Sabbath elevators so that you don't have to push a button. Uh, there's many things which are defined. Uh, some, uh, we, we find that uh, a, a certain amount of obedience to uh, brings you into uh, wanting to have a deeper relationship with God when you begin to look at some of the empty spaces and the values that you may be looking for in your life. As you begin to embrace the Sabbath, what will you do with it? Uh, what will you read during that time? What will you talk about during that time? <clears throat> How do you want to raise your children? What traditions do you want to pass on Lador Vador from generation to generation? And we, as we get older, we begin to become more sensitive to our roots and understanding, but available to all. The church has a day of grace. We have a day of rest. It's a, it's a, it's, 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 a, it's a different way of celebrating uh, in, in different areas. Uh, but we also see it as a season of entering a period of light and enlightenment, and uh, we do that by signifying by lighting a candle. Uh, then at the end of the Sabbath, we have Havdalah, or Havdala, which is the ending, which the candle is extinguished uh, in an overflowing cup of wine uh, for the blessing of Shavuot Tov, that you would have a good week. It would be overflowing with blessing until the next Shabbat as we go from the uh, holy back into the profane world that it is. I call it re-entry. Uh, it's a season of uh, a time of re-entry as you prepare yourself to dust yourself off. And you even, in God in his infinite wisdom, created the day to be evening, then morning. So you still have the afterglow of, uh, it's not Arab Shabbat, but it's now the uh, evening of uh, uh, Yom Rishon, of the first day, uh, Erev uh, Rishon, um, the, the uh, evening before the first day. So you even get an extra uh, couple of hours in, uh, in God's beautiful design. Uh, there are physical reasons 
for taking a hard break. Uh, yeah. you, you've experienced that in your own life. Uh, we talked about it for pitchers and for people, but there's actually scientific medical evidence which supports uh, uh, the physical uh, body's ability to rebound, regenerate. Yeah. We've had Dr. Timothy Jennings on the program to talk about the aging mind uh, and how we can reverse uh, early onset dementia uh, by doing, uh, taking time out, by stimulating the brain with non-repetitive activity. Work is a repetitive activity. Doesn't, yeah. it's, not, it's not that you're on an assembly line. What you do is a repetitive activity. Whether or not it's buying, yes. selling, building, doing this, it's a repetitive activity. It's breaking that pattern of that repetition, even by introducing, even liturgically, uh, in introducing something into it, whether or not it's hymns and psalms and, and, and reading or uh, fellowship or community or engaging in some other social activity. Uh, what are some of those physical responses to taking a hard break? Well, I mean, as I, I think I mentioned earlier, you know, there are 200 footnotes in my book, and I actually had to remove quite a few of them because there's so so much overwhelming scientific uh, research decades of research across millions of people that show that being connected and working all the time is actually really bad for you um, there are you know a, a few studies that come to mind is one of the the, the just having the sense of being on call um, and having your phone on or having email and responding to email and uh, texts um, that you have the equivalent of being on call and that the psychological, the markers of stress in your body, it's, it's measured by a, a chemical called cor cortisol. Right. Um, it takes about a day for the cortisol stress hormone to leave your body. So that's, a, again, a nice matching up with the fact that, you know, God has given us a day. Why like a whole day? As it turns out that you're carrying a lot of stress in your body and that it takes about a day for that to, uh, to, uh, to, to leave. I, just personally, I can tell you is that on the Sabbath, right around 2 or 3 or 4 p.m. on a Saturday, I suddenly have a big sigh and I'm, oh. I just finally got there. It normally just takes time. You just can't shut off your brain. Normally when I'm preparing for a Sabbath, there's frantic because I'm turning off my phone. There's all this stuff that I need to do before it starts. And it is craziness and, and jamming everything in. And then I'm still thinking about things. Some stuff is still on my mind. Some weeks are really hard. There's difficult situations. Um, and stuff that's bothering me, and it takes a while. And finally, so most often on Saturday afternoon, I'm like, oh, I'm not work Aaron, I'm not CEO Aaron, I'm not this person responsible to this or that. I'm just Aaron. And, it's, um, and I can feel it. I, I get a vacation every week. Like, who, who doesn't want that? And, and just mentally, psychologically, um, uh, the, the benefits are substantial. I'm excited to turn back on. I'm rejuvenated. I wonder what I've missed. And so every week there's this renewal period. And in the book that I share is just really, um, um, just really scary as I think a lot of people realize that something is wrong right now. And there's this mental health epidemic going on in our country. And I think it stems from the fact that we are facing an onslaught of information like we've never experienced. I heard some kind of statistic that the average person consumes more information in a day than the average person 100 years ago experienced in a year. Um, and, and we're being bombarded with information. Every contact that we have in our phone or social media we are ceding control to them so that they have the right to contact us at every moment. Now, we may not respond. We may think we have the freedom to respond, but they know they can reach us. 
Why are like, why, <clears throat> why are we giving them this control? And I think that it's causing these mental health issues. Well, you're exactly right. Uh, in the book, you outline seven steps to a successful Sabbath or Shabbat, uh, and you make a very compelling case uh, that you may think you're giving up 24 hours of productivity when actually what you're getting back is the greatest return of any 24-hour single investment you can make which is why God put it in the Ten Commandments, why yes. it is something that is to be done on a weekly basis. Uh, if you are Jewish and observant, uh, you not only get the 52, uh, but you have a minimum of 64 Sabbaths in the Jewish calendar. Uh, that's how important it is for God to have you set aside time for Him and for yourself. And if you don't think that there is value in this, uh, let me assure you that you cannot have a relationship with both God and man unless you have that horizontal piece that, that to sustain your vertical uh, and to sustain your horizontal at the same time, and that is the Sabbath. It is the hinge in which our relationship with God and our relationship with our fellow man depends on, and if that hinge seizes up, as it does for many, and it becomes rigid, then it's ultimately going to break. And it's no longer a hinge, it's now an impediment. And unless we take the time, both spiritually, physically, emotionally, uh, set aside the worries of this earth, devote time to both God and to our families, you will find that there is refreshment for your soul, there's renewal, and God has given us a wonderful command, and that is to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Aaron Edelheit has given us a message of a hard break, going and building the case. For you who are, you have to be appealed to at a logical level, you can't be appealed to at a spiritual level. You're, you're not philosophical, you're in the tangible. You're, you're uh, somebody that has to have the hard facts right in front of you, evidence that demands a verdict. This is evidence that demands the verdict in favor of a unanimous decision that a 24-6 <laughs> lifestyle is what will bring you health and healing to your bones, to your family, and to your work. Aaron Adelheid, thank you for sharing the hard break with us, how to adopt and build a case for the 24-6 lifestyle. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for helping me spread this message. God bless you, my friend. Thank you. We're going to, you take, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.